Good morning, everyone. Please turn with me to Psalm 101, actually, 101. As we look at the message this morning, or the topic this morning, everywhere, everywhere. And the reason the word everywhere stood out uh, to me this morning was back when I was in preaching school. I talk about that an awful lot. But there was a point at which a mentor encouraged us. Uh, certain phases of your life, you're going to need a theme. God willing, it'll be something that's straight biblical, but it needs to be something that can carry you through difficult times. And as they had a, another minister come in and build on that theme, he had set for himself a theme of everywhere. And I don't remember exactly how he put it, but it was something along the lines that um, I wanted to take God everywhere in my life so that we could then take God everywhere through our lives. And what that meant to me was, as I went up to that young man after uh, his, his lesson or his encouragement, I said, I'm stealing that if that's okay. He said, that's fine. <laughs> it's like, I didn't invent it. <laughs> so if you feel like you need to borrow it, take it. Because it set out for me during that period of my ministry the need to make sure that there was no place in my life that was off limits to God's Holy Spirit. And why did that matter to me at least this week? Well, because I'm in that transition, as most folks are asking, have you moved up here yet? Have you moved up here yet? And the answer is no. <laughs> but I'm in the process of it. And in the process of moving, there are some things I got to get clean. Why? Because as I'm looking at new places, I appreciate the way that the office was left for me. Clean. So clean that as I'm trying to record content, it's echoing off the walls. And someone can tell you I'm trying to fix the echoes off the walls. That's a good thing because it was cleaned for me. And so to the degree that it was cleaned for me, I want to leave behind a clean place. Why? Because it stuck out in my mind that this uh, Psalm 101 sits in the middle of two concepts, an Old Testament concept that goes back to those early books, the law that we talked about and talking about foundations. And it goes all the way to the time of Paul when he talks about this whole concept of unleavened bread, what we just got through taking, right? And that whole concept of unleavened goes back to the Feast of unleavened bread. <laughs> and that was a feast that took place at the beginning of the year. God reset the Hebrew calendar around Passover. And immediately around the time of Passover, there was that feast of unleavened bread. He said, you got to get rid of all the leaven, all of it. And Paul drew on that metaphor saying, spiritually, we are a house for the Lord. And he was talking about uh, congregationally at that point, but it carries over here in Psalm 101. Why? Because when I saw David talking in Psalm 101 about the cleansing, the thing that started to recur to me is he's talking about all these different places that just didn't click with me the first few times I went through it. And so as I'm going through Psalm 101 with you today, I want us to understand how, as our brother read Psalm 100, a psalm that you have over the door as you enter this place of worship, says, let us enter this place with thanksgiving in our heart. Let us, let us enter his courts with praise. The one thing he says at the end of that Psalm 100 says, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. We talked a lot about uh, the steadfast love of the Lord, but... It stood out to me that that is a transition into verse 1 of Psalm 101 where he says, I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you, sorry, oh, when will you come to me? I will walk in the integrity of heart within my house. And that's two places right there. Because just within David, I saw three things going on. He was talking about his song. He's going to sing of steadfast love. And I'm thinking of singing. That's not the first thing I'm thinking of singing about. But it helped me understand that in times of difficulty, uh, one of the things that are first, or that, that go for me first, is my joy. It's that place in my heart that says, okay, yeah, I know there's certain things. We've talked about it before. There are things i got to do, but do I still really enjoy those things? And no matter what David was going through at this point, he wasn't simply studying steadfast love. He had gotten into a place where beyond head knowledge, it was a place where it was natural for him to enjoy to the point where it was a part of his song. And my encouragement to you, first and foremost, is no matter what is going on with you at this point, please at least take the time to realize whether or not you are in a place where you still enjoy the things that you're doing. We talked about it before in previous weeks. The difference between rolling out of bed and hitting snooze because you just want to stay in bed that day or whether or not you actually have joy. 
And here's the thing. In all these places where David is asking for cleansing in his life, here's the, the hack, for lack of a better term. Uh, I get overwhelmed when I think of cleaning up my place because I don't do a very good job of it. And the beautiful thing about the difference between me cleaning up my place and the Holy Spirit encouraging me to be clean is he's not telling me to clean myself. He's simply saying, give me access to everywhere. And I'm here to help you get your joy, your song back. And it goes back to that time when sometimes I want to take on too much of the burden, right? Sometimes I'd like to pat myself on the back when I get it done. Sometimes that's too, too exhausted. I'm just on autopilot. I just feel like it's always, I got, I got something I got to get done. No. It's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. Like we said, once we get past to that point where it feels like the whole concept of God being with us all the time starts to feel like it's a condemnation, it's an aid for us to naturally be able to go beyond study, beyond obedience, as our brother mentioned in class this morning, to a place where the Holy Spirit is restoring our joy. One of the things that can be difficult in opening up everywhere and all this, there's some things I like to do, and as we get to, get to other places where David is getting on this list, it's, it's a pretty convicting list. If you're to the point where you read through this psalm and none of this is troubling you, hats off to you. Good job. <laughs> I still, if I'm not still struggling with some of this stuff, I'm still tempted by it from time to time. But understand, beyond uh, the, the whole concept of him uh, still having a song, him singing of steadfast love and justice, he will ponder, though. That's a part of it. Because why? Sometimes the way in which the Holy Spirit is guiding me back into a place of peace within my heart, it really comes back from things that I might have studied, learned, and understood in the past that the, the trials of life have made just kind of a, 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 almost a figment of my imagination. Now, the Holy Spirit reminds me, no, they're not. They're just things that have been lost in your struggle. And so to the degree I have uh, approached a place where I can have peace, sometimes it's important to realize that I need to take a break, but I do also need to get back to his word because my troubles probably aren't over. If he's going to bless me with more days to live, I'm sure the enemy is going to bless me with more obstacles, right? And so just like you save up for another rainy day, storing up that scripture in your heart and putting it into practice. Oh, wait, is he going to go on to say, I will then, in the latter part of verse 2, I will walk with integrity of heart. That word we keep hearing over and over again. So he's going beyond finding his joy, not, not just simply content with studying his word, but he is walking it out with a certain level of over and over again integrity. And what I started to realize in this passage is beyond what I had mentioned to you all before in terms of integrity being a cool thing to study, this is another place where we get to see a deeper uh, perspective of all the different places David want in, wanted integrity to live in and around him. So as we've already seen, David wants integrity to live in him, but beyond that, he's going to say, I will walk with integrity of heart where? Within my house. And he's going to pick that up again in verse 7, where he's going to say, no one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. But there are times when even within your home, not necessarily just your home, we talked about it before, uh, we've got places of business, we've got places to work, you can't always control the tenor and the tone of everywhere you go, but you can sometimes have more control over something else he's going to talk about, his presence, his presence. So even if you can't control the entire environment and make it a place of integrity or a place where it's easy for you to have peace, God willing, you can pray for him and the Holy Spirit to help you carve out places of peace within your presence, even in an otherwise unpleasant environment. As he'll go on to say in verse 3, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. And I'm so not going to try to preach every verse of this passage, but <laughs> that concept of worthless for me, it can be a little bit deceptive because it's not like, oh, we look at it, it has no value whatsoever. There are certain portions of that word or certain definitions of that term. It's more like a balance sheet. So the place where that term can be deceptive is if I look at a thing and I say, well, there's no value in that at all. Yeah, that's one thing that might be worthless. But on balance, there are things that appear to have value that may actually be bringing money in if we're looking at it from the perspective of the balance sheet. But we all know if you're spending more than you're taking it in, you've got problems, right? And that's what he's talking about in terms of integrity and our role in our families. Even if we are contributing, if we are taking more than we are giving, that is really what is also included in this term, worthless. It's making sure you understand on balance, are you contributing and how are you contributing to the peace and the prosperity, for lack of a better term, 
just the general well-being of your environment. That's what that term worthless, worthless really, really seems to go to more. So go on to say, I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Does he say he hates those who fall away? No. <laughs> He just says, in order to have peace, I have to have a certain space within my presence where no matter how much I love an individual, I have to, for my own peace of mind and my own ability to do what God is asking me to do, I have to carve out places of space that give me healthy distance. I think Paul said, uh, we don't, we're in the world, we're not of it. It's not calling us to leave the world behind and build a, a stronger bubble, right? <laughs> He's calling us to understand how to function within any environment. We've talked about it before. The foundations for the peace that surpasses understanding. Understand or helps us understand the way that we can set up, uh, one of the things I, I talk about from time to time, boundaries, even in difficult circumstances. So it's not the people that he hates. It's the work of those who are no longer committed to the things of God, at least not in the way that they should be, that God willing, that will not manifest itself in me, and hopefully to the degree I've decided I'm going to commit my way to the things that God is asking me to do, the work of those who are going a different way, that will not cling to me, even as I still love and pray for them as I pray for myself to write my path in the Holy Spirit. He'll keep going on to say in verse 4, a perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. And our brother here works, and we got a chance to chat this week, in areas of law enforcement that deal with what we would call perversion. But once again, this is another one of those terms that if you go into different translations, and if you look at it, it's a, it's a wider net. It includes that, but it really includes that theme that comes up over and over in the Psalms, and that's making sure that what I present to you outwardly is who I am inwardly. It's that whole concept that's set apart from uprightness would be an antonym. Uprightness ba basically means just like that path to the door is straight from the pulpit to the door. Uh, that whole concept of perverseness talks about a crooked way, meaning you present one way, uh, but there are really some bends in what's going on in your heart and in your motives. And what he is saying, help me, God, uh, to align my inside, who I am in my heart, with what I am presenting outwardly. And so, of course, that is a portion of what our brother works uh, to overcome, because I don't think we, we find very many people who are involved in those kinds of crimes who are like, that's who I am. No, right? <laughs> But it's not just them. It's a temptation for us all insofar as we have things that we are working on that we're not comfortable having people see. So it's a much broader term than just what we would con uh, conventionally think of when we think of a perverse heart shall be far from me. It's another way of David essentially seeming to say, as he said so often through the Psalms, help me be a straight arrow. One of the highest compliments I've ever heard anybody get. That person is a stand-up person, Right? That is what it seems to be, that David is asking for in this, that he be seen as a person who is stand up, straightforward, and even when he makes mistakes, he's willing to embrace them so he can get back, oh, um, back to that place where people see him as being consistent in what he presents and who he actually is. As he goes on, he's going to say, uh, verse 5, whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. If you've never been tempted to say something, well, okay, then you, you like I said, you're doing better than me. <laughs> but there, life's going to take us all, right, into places where we're going to be tempted. Pain-free life. Anybody figured that out yet? Thank you, right? <laughs> and so when I hurt, I'm tempted to say some things. And the people who hurt me ain't always around, Right? But they thank you. <laughs> Does that mean the pain has gone away? No. <laughs> but it means like another psalm that David played, uh, prayed. Help me, God, uh, to put a guard over my mouth. He says when he is in, once again, that concept of presence, when he is in the presence of the wicked. I need that more than when I'm in it. I can, I can go off saying some things I don't need to say when I'm all alone by myself. Things that don't need to find their way to my lips, right? And sometimes I, I have more leeway then because there's nobody to hear it. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to vent, but sometimes I need you to, okay, that was a moment. Let's not make that a habit, though, because <laughs> I don't need to keep saying that, right? And so ultimately, that's one of the things he is talking about. Um, going on in the second half, whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. One of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, Clive Staples Lewis, a Christian who went to war, and in war he found atheism because he said there is no way that a loving God could put me in the middle of all this suffering. But the thing I love about C.S. Lewis is he found his way back to God 
And in the process of finding his way back to God, he did a lot of writing, not just the children's books, right, but a lot of guidance for just people who were trying to find their way back to God, right? And one of the things he said is in terms of, of pride, it's one of those things that it's easy for me to see in some part of yours, but it's not so easy for me to see in the mirror, right? And I talk about that from time to time. Because we're in a culture that allows us, no matter who you are, no matter what uh, end of the political spectrum you are, everybody has a place they can go to help point fingers somewhere else, don't we? Everyone has that in common. If you don't believe me, get online. You can find your, right? We can, find, we can all find our tribe online who's pointing the finger. Oh, it's over there, bud. <laughs> it ain't here. <laughs> And so that is one of the things that he says about pride. He says one of the great struggles in a book he calls Mere Christianity. We're talking about that whole, I didn't give him a, a shout out when I preached foundation, but that whole concept of a foundation. What is it that comprises the basic beliefs that Jesus taught that ties us all together as believers? That was inspired by C.S. Lewis because he wrote a whole book called Mere Christianity where he tried to, in all the de- denominations that he saw in his day, he tried to sort through it. And that's one of the things he said that's common to all believers beyond our a common belief system, we have some common challenges, and that is basically being able to see the pride in ourselves the same way or with the same clarity we see it and with the same way it can affect us when we see it in others. Why? Because I say it from time to time. Fixing you doesn't fix my relationship with him, right? And so even though I may be able to see some things that others need to work on, fundamentally the relationship I have to work on that's most important is my relationship with God. But ultimately, I don't, God, John is very straightforward. None of us have seen God at any time. No. Have you? Okay. No. <laughs> Sorry. But he says you see him in your brothers and your sisters. And so that's the measurement by which you begin to understand whether you're developing a better relationship with him. Why? Because by the time we get to the end of the psalm, David is going to not simply talk about things that he does not want in his presence. He's going to talk about things that he does or people he wants in his presence. Verse 6, I will look with favor on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. These are the things that he wants in his presence. He says the perfect people? Good luck with that. He'd have no friends. We said it before. But he specifically says the faithful in the land. He's going to look at with, um, I'm just going to give them what they deserve. No, he's looking at them with favor. Why? Because if you've ever had friends, good friends over time, they're going to mess up. And if you're going to stay friends, you're going to have to look at each other with favor. <laughs> And I love the fact that David gets that. It's not about the perfection of the good times. It's about the fact that he simply understands that they have a pattern in their life that he can identify and trust and say, these are the kind of people I want in my circle. And to the degree they make mistakes, I still want them there. I just want to help them get to a place where we can all move forward more efficiently. And so that is what it seems to uh, say to me when he's saying um, he wants the faithful in the land. And once again, when he talks about the ones who are blameless, are you supposed to stop me there? Is that what that says? <laughs> Talk about I me. Mean, there are times when he talks about blameless people, but that's not here. Here he says, who walks in the way that is blameless. There's a difference. <laughs> There's a difference. It's like understanding where a person frequents or where they go. That has a lot to do with what their motives are. Now, even if you're in the habit of going to to great places and being around healthy people, you may stumble and stray from time to time. But if people trust what you're committed to, then that's the basis by which David is saying, I still want this person in my circle, in my presence, beyond the house, beyond the city, beyond the the nation. These These are people I want with me. Why? Because I have to have an example of people who can overcome as well as people who can simply show me what it's like to do right. Why? Because we know David's story. He's the one who wrote this psalm. He had plenty to overcome. And so I don't need people who are never making mistakes or caring, when we get in the habit of carrying ourselves as though we, we don't ever know. This is one of my dead horse issues. I'm sorry, this is going to be... I need people in me who, sorry, I need people with me who can show me an example of what it is like to have the confidence, the other, other side of manhood we don't talk about quite as much, to be able to acknowledge when we make mistakes. 
and beyond just acknowledging that we make mistakes, to help me show a pattern of what it's like for a grown man to get up from mistakes and just do better. And so I need that in a friend. Why? Because I don't want to be the kind of person who always feels like I have to keep up that distance between who I am and what I'm presenting. I want that distance to close. And if I'm never truly repenting, I'm not closing that gap. I'm not closing that gap at all. And so I need, I want to surround myself with people who help me understand what it's like to close that gap. And it seems like that's what David is talking about as well. At this point, I don't think he can still present himself as a perfect man. Maybe he wrote this early on in his life, but he seems to be a seasoned man at this point who understands what it's like to need to be forgiven. And therefore, he wants people, like we said, not perfect people, but people who are confident enough to be able to walk the path back to God, being honest about the mistakes they've made and how they want to do better, how they want to give, this is me paraphrasing again, how they want to give the Holy Spirit access to everywhere in their lives. Understanding it's not our responsibility to clean it up ourselves. We have a responsibility, but some of the things that God is calling us to do are dependent upon us partnering with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes the only thing he is asking us to do, at least first, as we said, is just give him access to everywhere He'll go on in verse 7 to say, no one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land. That's the other place I saw. So he's not simply saying it's about me. I want to clean myself up. Why? Because if you've ever been in a situation where you have committed to making changes, you don't want to go right back out in the environments that tempt you to make the same mistakes. Do you really want to walk that path again? If you really know what it's like to be forgiven and the pain of having to recover, do you really want to start over? Oh, maybe. But see, for me, when I really feel what it's like to have to come back from uh, two steps back (laughs) in a season when I should have just been making steps forward, I just don't want to do that again. And the things that really put me in that situation most um, are times when I have cleansed my my, my own motives or no, 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 no. Um, when I put myself in a position where God has actually shown me some progress and I go right back to an environment where I'm feeling way stronger than I actually am. And so that's what he's talking about. It's not just in him. It's not just in the home. He's saying our homes exist in a larger environment where no matter what is going on, we don't necessarily have the ability. I don't know a nation on the face of the planet, even biblically or modern or in modern times, that was just so enamored with who we are as Christians that they just changed all the laws to to make it a comfortable place for us to serve Jesus. You know that place yet? Yeah, me neither. (laughs) But what happens is you don't necessarily have to change the boundaries within a nation or the laws within a nation for you to simply be able to set up places in your own person, in your own heart, in your own home. We say, as much as I love what I have here, these are some places where I'm going to have to set up Boundaries. These are places where I differ with my municipality, with my nation, of course, with the world, in order to be able to carve out those places of peace, where I can begin to, once again, progress without having to take the proverbial two steps back to just get another step forward. Understand, he's going to say, um, uh, beyond that, at the end of verse 8, cutting off all evildoers from the city of the Lord. And that is going to be the, the fifth place, I think, I saw. Um, David talk about cleansing or making sure he's carved out a home for integrity. Once in, in himself, um, in his home, in his presence, in his city, and then in all the land. Uh, but the one thing that helped me uh, realize David's struggle is um, it's one thing for David as a king to say, I want to carve out places of integrity. But understand, David was called when he was just a shepherd boy. And so we talk about um, none of us necessarily know my brother talked about in the young adults class this morning, the end of a thing. But God sees the end of a thing from the beginning. And so he doesn't tell us to start getting these habits after we've gotten that promotion or after we've gotten to that place where we want to go. These things start now. <laughs> because even though you may not have the ability to set the tone in your environment the way that you would like, you have no idea how God will respond to you setting healthy environments just in your presence. I think I heard somewhere the word says, if you are faithful over a little, I'll make you ruler over much. And so it starts right now with whatever you consider your sphere of influence to be. First of all, it's just you. 
But like we said, sometimes it's just your presence. And we don't know how God will bless that once he sees people who are willing to simply carry forward his will in the young adult class. We talked about mercy, <laughs> the whole concept of mercy, because we had a, a question. Well, uh, when a, a non-believer, someone's challenging the Bible and suggests, well, if God didn't carry through on that prophecy, how can the Bible be true? Because there's this whole page, uh, page chapter in, in Deuteronomy 18 that says these are the signs of a false prophet. And the, if the prophet says something's going to happen and it doesn't happen, you don't have to listen to them. Okay? So if God says something's going to happen and it doesn't happen, the Bible's clearly wrong, right? No. It's because all those prophecies were founded on this whole concept of mercy. And so the only reason he gave the condemnation in the first place was to convince people to make a turn that would avoid the necessity for the consequence. And so that is what we were looking at in this chapter. At least that's what it meant uh, to me because it took me back to a point in my life. I try not to tell too many personal stories, especially when they put somebody in a negative light. But this ends up putting the person in um, a light. Um, it reminds me of how much I admire them. Um, way back in the day, I'm going to start off telling you, this is TMI, too much information, right? <laughs> Uh, dated a young lady. She was um, an amazing person. Just had a great heart for people. And that was one of the reasons why I wasn't comfortable around her. Um, I was an oddball and she took me in. But I was like, wait, these are, they're, they're odder than me. And so <laughs> I wanted to set up boundaries and barriers in her life, understanding that the only reason I got access was because she was super kind to me. And I was so uncomfortable because I was like, I don't know. I just don't. I think we got to have more boundaries than this because I think and not all relationships have to end poorly. We separated when our separate ways. And eventually, eventually she calls me and she needed representation because she ended up what we would call catching a case. But the thing with this young woman was because she had spent so much time being so kind to so many people, when she called me and needed representation, I didn't think the, the slightest bit less of her at that point. And sometimes people can persuade you. Okay, Marcus, you're just, they call it a simp. You're just a simp. <laughs> you're just a pushover for this pretty young lady. But we, we went before the judge, and I didn't have a whole lot to say. She was very straightforward about what happened. She wouldn't make a whole lot of excuses. She really just wanted a second chance. And so ultimately the judge, okay, I say maybe it's just me, but the judge saw the same thing, and I didn't know. But after he ended up having mercy on this young woman, I got a chance to talk to the judge, and he told me something. He's like, she reminded me of my daughter, Marcus. And I didn't know that before, right? And so one of the reasons why this whole concept of David wanting to show favor to the faithful in the land is this. See, God knows that relationship between me and her, we could have ended up on terms where she never would have wanted to pick up the phone and call Marcus for anything, right? I would have could have been in a place where I never wanted to hear from her again. But it wasn't like that. And then likewise, out of all the judges in that city, that's a pretty big city too, it's Minneapolis. <laughs> all the judges in that city, you think everybody would have had a heart for, would have reminded, she would have reminded everybody? No. <laughs> and so it's one thing to be able to fool some of the people some of the time, an ex-boyfriend who's just a simp, <laughs> or a judge who's just a little bit too sympathetic to a young woman coming to his courtroom because she reminds him his daughter, that's not the law. But when you live in a manner that causes God to want to show you favor, then he aligns the people that you blessed as friends in your life with the people who don't even know you, but there's something in you that still makes them want to show you mercy. And God puts them in situations where they can come together and basically help you understand the value of what David is saying here. It's not perfection. It's what pattern are you getting into in your life? Are you showing the kind of love to other people that makes them eager to want to pick up the phone when you call? Are you showing the kind of love to people that no matter how you've impressed them, you love them so much that God wants to align things in your favor in unlikely circumstances? We're just flat out guilty. Where people get to see it again because you've gotten in the habit of telling the truth that someone's willing to show you some mercy. And so God brings the people to whom you've been kind together with the people who are impressed with your honesty and he brings you some favor. And that's what this is all about, at least in this chapter. That's what I saw this week when I looked at Psalm 101 and I saw all the different places where David was looking to have God bring him some cleansing. And I started realizing all the difficulty I can have in wanting to give the Holy Spirit access to all those different places in my life. I began to realize, like we say, it's not all about the 
sacrifice that he's calling to make, calling me to make, much like the prophet Isaiah and all the condemnation uh, that God uh, offered through the prophets. The books don't start with condemnation. <laughs> the whole story, war, uh, sorry, the whole story of the Bible starts in Genesis. Like we said, a place that's really pretty nice to live. The condemnation comes along later. The prophets. Isaiah talks about a time when they're beating their swords into plowshares. Not fighting anymore. That's where all that condemnation that comes later, that's the start of it. And so when we're reading this book, God willing, more and more, we're starting to see it for how he intended it. A place where we can pretty much just live (laughs) in healthy, as we say sometimes, maybe too much, peaceful. And likewise, prosperous places because he didn't mean for us to struggle even if he brings us through certain struggles, whether whether they be financial or whatever. But the thing that he's always doing, whether it's in these struggles or these condemnations or these rebukes that he's giving us, is he's trying to get us back to a place where people, first and foremost, are eager to show us mercy. And so this is a time we come together at the end. We call it invitation, where if you have um, some places in your life where you know, I got God and I got this place in my life and I'm not comfortable even acknowledging to God that I need the Holy Spirit to help me cleanse this corner of my life. The beauty of inviting him into every corner of, of our lives, <laughs> there's good news and there's bad news. Bad news is there might be other corners that I still haven't seen. <laughs> it still needs some cleaning, but I need to know that. <laughs> and so if I find the courage to invite him in everywhere, he's going to break the bad news to me, but it's also going to be an entryway to the good news <laughs> that I don't have to clean those places myself. And so as we all stand together and sing, whether you're a believer or not, this is the time we have the chance to either come forward or just go to God on your own and say, God, I want you to send your Holy Spirit everywhere in my life to give me the kind of cleaning you know that I can have so that I can reach the potential you know I can reach. This is our prayer in Jesus. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm I'm skipping to the prayer. That's my prayer for me in Jesus' name. And as I sometimes say, my prayer for you is my prayer for me. But that is uh, what you have the opportunity to do if you want to come down front as we stand and together sing. My life and let it be consecrated.